Wow, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Michael Trujillo, and I'm uh, one of the artists in this show. I'm also a member of the Gallery QI uh, Faculty Committee, and I am here to welcome us. This is my first in-person live thing since the last in the last two years. So if I'm a little uh, if I'm a little fumbly and sketchy, well, to all of you and all of us, yeah. Um, so be, forgive me if I, if I do something crazy, if I just fall on the ground or start throwing objects, just know that's what it is. Um, I'm going to introduce what our show is, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the film that I made for the installation and show you a single channel sound version of it that is uh, with subtitles, so you can sort of see it and get kind of a sense of what the film is. And then I'm going to ask Bobby McElver, who's my collaborator on the project, to talk about his process of mixing and spatializing and collaborating on how we designed and how he designed the sound in that space uh, with his wave field synthesis uh, approach. Um, then I'm going to introduce Patricia Stone, or Trish Stone, uh, who's going to talk about uh, her project, uh, the anti-plague game. And then I'm going to introduce, and then I'll introduce Sharuk Yedagiri, who's going to talk about his piece that's up in the courtyard where we'll be having our reception that you can uh, experience, which is the multi-channel music for courtyards. So um, the bios for all of us are on the posters and flyers. So I'm not going to read them in their entirety, but I will say that I am a professor here in the visual arts department and have been making music and video and film and sound works for, um, for a very long time and exhibited them in a lot of places. Likewise, Bobby is a professor in the theater. Bobby McElver is a professor in the theater and dance department and has worked in uh, spatial audio, music, dance, theater, and the performing arts, and was a member of the Wooster Group in New York, and is uh, continuing his work with wave field synthesis and spatialized sound. Trish Stone, who's also the coordinator of the gallery QI, and uh, who helped us pull this entire event together in the midst of pandemic and Obocron. Uh, Trish Stone is a new media artist uh, who does, makes work that deals with issues of surveillance and intimacy and has many works that include performance, installation, and games in augmented and virtual reality. So her game is available to play. And Shirok Yadagiri is a composer and sound designer and professor in the Department of Music who is, uh, has had many uh, lumin uh, luminaries as collaborators like Peter Sellers, Robert Woodruff, Anne Hamilton, and many others. Uh, he is going to talk about his piece in the courtyard. So that's the introductions. Sorry if I'm a little uh, shaky with the public speaking. Shirok, are we doing all right? Thumbs up, Shirok? Okay, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for anytime Shirok gives me thumbs up, I feel like I'm doing good. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the, the title of the show, Antibody. Uh, one of my colleagues and the chair of my department, Ricardo Dominguez, is also a committee member on the gallery QI committee. And he had, we were talking about the shows that were possible, and he was talking with me about a project I'd been working on uh, back in March, around the time I got vaccinated. I made an EP uh, called Antibody. Uh, my music, the, music, the name I use as a musician is Starve Lab. And I made this uh, between the time I got my first shot and the time I was able to go out after my second shot. And in that window, I just made a, a short collection of music and I made a music video for it. And over the quarantine and, and pandemic, I'd been learning about and making a lot of works uh, using digital strategies in cinema and, uh, and animation, but I'd also been making a lot of different kinds of music. Music's been a fundamental component of my practice um, in my, for my entire career. And so in talking about the show, we were thinking about, Ricardo Dominguez suggested antibodies as an idea, as a, as a kind of collective framing mechanism, and it really resonated with me and with the other artists who became involved with the show because it becomes not only kind of a literal manifestation of what we're cultivating in our own physical bodies to resist this virus. But there are other ways in which everything from the metaphor of the antibody to the pun of the antibody becomes something that we can think about. Like what is, what is the body? What's the function of the body? What's a good body? What's a bad body? What's a sick body or a healthy body? Um, and what is an antibody? And a lot of my work recently has been thinking about sort of language and um, a cosmic science fiction um, allegory or metaphor to, to think about my own relationship to rage, uh, to the work that I've been doing and have done and, and the work I've been done my entire career around issues of justice, uh, around issues of uh, anti-racism, 
uh, in resistance to the patriarchy and uh, cishet uh, sort of normalization. And in this, in this work, uh, thinking about science fiction and looking at not just the history of science fiction, but thinking about the ways in which the cosmos, the ways in which the technologies, the ways in which the magic of science fiction provide various outlets is, is a one that's especially inspiring to me and very much influenced by uh, writers like Samuel Delaney and uh, Ursula Le Guin and um, artists like uh, my friend Colleen Smith and the filmmaker who I recently was speaking to, Alison O'Daniel, who makes sprawling works that both are very naturalistic and speak to contemporary and personal issues, but also speak to their own uh, sense of what is possible beyond what we can understand on Earth as people. What else is possible? What world can we make? And so part of this is making this, I've been writing this project since way before the pandemic called Unmake the Uncosmos Ecstatic, a song cycle in three movements. And so I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm just sort of putting it on the screen as a way of giving you a sense of the structural model that I'm thinking about. Right now in the show, in the gallery, is verse one for the 10 uh, grounded stacks. Um, and that's the, what we're going to see in a second. But I wanted to give you a sense of kind of the scale of the project and the way that I'm thinking about scale, even in terms of time and place. That as I was working on this, I was thinking about novels like novels by Alastair Reynolds that are looking at hundreds and hundreds of years of time um, in the cosmos and the ways in which sort of the interpersonal and the connective and the, 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 the transformative capacities of people and non-people can be understood when we're not limited to um, you know, the last 24 hours or the last 10 minutes on Instagram or the last week or the last two years during a pandemic. Um, so a lot of this work uses the language of the stack versus for the 10 grounded stacks versus for the 10 cosmic stacks. And I'm indebted to my colleague, Benjamin Bratton, who kind of coined the model or kind of sort of in, you know, framed the model of the stack as a way of thinking about planetary scale computing. Um, I'm not going to give a lecture or talk on the stack. Benjamin is very well equipped and very uh, well versed in his own theory and his own model. What I really liked was the word, the stack, as a way of, of thinking about planetary scale um, experience beyond what we normally associate with Earth, that there could be not just the stack that represents the Earth, our cloud, our city, our address, our interface, our user, or me, but what if there are many grounded stacks? What if there are many planets that were their own stacks? And what happens when we don't have an Earth-based computational model, but we have a cosmos-based computational model? And so the grounded stacks and the cosmic stacks are really a principal metaphor um, that I'm using, and, but it's a model that I'm, I want to make sure I acknowledge and, and, and am indebted to in my colleagues uh, work. This work is very much about connection. It's about intimacy. The work can be, um, the project is really interested in uh, forms of violence, including political violence and resistance to political violence, resistance to the violence of law enforcement, re resistance to the violence of um, the state or of systems of, of capital but also connection beyond that, that the connection of intimacy, of sexuality, of tenderness, of empathy become really um, important to me in this work. And so exploring that in a context that is both soft and hard, like the fabric and the, the eighth inch, the, the, the quarter inch jacks, the idea of the body as being permeable by the technology of magic or the technology of the cosmos, the notion that there are places and people who in my, in this larger mythology, um, have the capacity to be connective, not only with themselves and body to body, but the body as something that doesn't end where the skin ends. That the body uh, ends where the skin ends only in our minds, but just past our skin is all of the matter around us. And just past that is Bobby or Sharok. And this separation that we imagine is an illusion. It's a, it's, a, it's a concept. This is the way that I'm framing it in these stories. And so with that, I'm going to play you. This is a still from the film. I'm going to play you this film. And then I will um, say just a couple more things. And then I will hand it over to Bobby. Uh, and then Ruben or someone lovely will get the lights for us.
We can't breathe the air here. The light burns our eyes and makes our skin scarred and thick. There is a sound in the air and it burrows deep in our mind. The sound of machines and distress and complaint. But more than anything is the sound of your fucking voice. The sight of you. Knowing you continue to walk around unafraid, unmolested, unfazed. You. An unlovable and unkind and impossibly selfish person. You call yourself a mother. You are a vampire. What will it take to hurt you? How long will you tolerate the loneliness surrounded by people yet unwanted and despised? The people you admire actually see you as an embarrassment. Your friends are anxious and embarrassed to be a friend to such a shell of a person. Something inside of you is broken and sick. When you try loving something, it becomes infected like a wound. And deep down, you know this is all true. When you return to your home or your bed or your quiet moments, you know this heckling, creeping, persistent voice ringing in your mind is true. You are not good. You are not enough. Every pulse is a revolution and still the sickened, fat, diseased royals rule from their thrones and pockets and stomachs. We've made our own move with an army of dreaming and song. Our moon is the resistance to your sickness of power. Our moon is a song moon, a fuck moon. We are a pleasure planet and we refuse your siege. The hyper-connected find no pleasure in senses, only in drifting. We produce ecstatic taste and touch and song and light. You are small. Your coalition is not real. Nothing is real. not real. Nothing is real.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So making this film during a pandemic where I couldn't work with actors, where I couldn't work with sets, where I couldn't shoot anything, forced me to learn a series of sort of strategies that allowed me to make it all virtually. Um, the character we see that we hear from throughout is my sister-in-law, Angelina Spicer, who's a professional actress and comedian. Uh, I would r encourage you to Google postpartum revolution. She is part of a movement and a part of a project that is working on behalf of women, uh, speaking about and healing from postpartum in their, uh, in their birth journeys and stories. And she very uh, grace graciously and gracefully uh, collaborated with me over Zoom. So I knew that I was staging this project, which I started in October uh, after talking to Bobby. And one of the things that I learned from working with Bobby, and he's going to talk about wave field synthesis, was this surround sound, um, I know I'm being reductive when I call it that, the wave field synthesis project. And so I knew that w w in working with him, I could begin to think about the music and the sound that I wanted to, to design for the project. And I went, because I got really obsessed with string quartets in, in August, and it's really that simple. Like, I just got obsessed. And so I just started writing a bunch of string quartets in August, and that's one and one, and they became part of this. And I was thinking about them in terms of placing the cello and the violin, the viola, the violin, and sort of thinking about how they could move, and 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 then the voice could be a center anchoring point. Um, but I'm really uh, grateful to Angelina, who's the only other actor in this film. I'm the I'm an actor in the film. I'm sitting on the chair with the blue head, but I got rid of my head, and it, the helmet wouldn't go over all this hair. And anyway, um, but. All the other human beings you see are digital models, and all of the other elements are digital models. All the spaces are digital models. Um, it's, a, it's an outcome of, of really being re kind of uh, kept out of the world and kept in my house uh, due to what we've all gone through. And so part of what you're seeing is a result of those restraints and those, those conditions uh, being um, restraining conditions. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot more about the film, though I'm sure if you have questions, you'll ask them. And during our discussion together, I can say more. Um, but I am very interested in what it means to listen to someone who's saying something to you or to us as an audience, and what the difference between hearing something and being sad and hearing something and witnessing, um, how those two experiences can be different. That a message may not be for me, but I can still witness that message, listen to that message, experience that message um, without taking on that message. And th these are things that I was thinking a lot about. Um, that's all for me. And I want to welcome Bobby McElver to come speak about his version of the project. Hi. Give me a second to uh, set up this HDMI here.
we didn't do the thing where we put all the slideshows on the same computer, so bear with us. Getting back into doing live events. Okay. Um, let's see, do we have it? No. Give me a second. Um, hey, there we go. There we go. Okay, okay. All right. Oh, no, it went away. There it is. Okay, hopefully this isn't going to keep happening here. There we go. Okay. Give me one second here. Hi. Thanks. We're ready now. Um. Oh, you know what? I'm going to full screen this. Almost. I lied. There we go. Let's get that a little bigger. Okay, there we go. Uh, hi, I'm Bobby, uh, I'm a professor in theater and dance. I see some theater and dance people. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm also, I just wanted to mention, I'm also working uh, soon at the um, New Franklin Antonio Hall building with uh, a new collective called the Incubator Collective. There's some of us back here. Um, that are working under the Anthropology, Performance, and Technology program in Jacobs School of Engineering. Um, so some exciting stuff happening over there. Stay tuned. Um, today, uh, I want to talk about the sound system that's being used in the gallery, which is using wave field synthesis. And I'll explain briefly kind of what that is. Um, what you just heard on the film was sort of a mono, maybe stereo, was it mono? Stereo mix. Fairly flat, right? The sound is coming from the screen. That's it. Um, what you'll hear in the gallery is much more three-dimensional intentionally. Um, and so with wave field synthesis, you can make, quote, sound holograms. And um, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing that with a custom-built high-density speaker array. So these are speakers that I built myself. Uh, what is wave field synthesis? Uh, it is a spatial audio rendering technique. Uh, places virtual sound sources in real space and it creates accurate wavefronts. So you know, the synthesis is precise, and it's physically correct. So you can't distinguish between the synthesized source from a real wave field um, at frequencies that are below the upper limit of what the system can spatially uh, render. So in short, it makes a sound hologram. You can put your head in it. It's very exciting. It can sit in space. It can move around 3D space. Um, we're going to skip the math, because this is an art show. We don't need to learn math. Um, but we'll look at this image, because this helps understand what's going on here. So all of those speakers are very, very close together. And that's very important for wave field synthesis. If you have a lot of speakers very close together, they can all play individual parts of a sound wave. So like this guitar example, every one of those speakers uh, is playing a piece of this sound wave that is um, locating the sound where it is behind the speakers. If you take the guitar away, the speakers still do the work. It sounds accurately like the guitar is there. So that's great. You can put stuff behind an array, have it sound very accurate for everyone in the audience. But what I found was more interesting was putting sounds in front of the array. So if you inverse the equation, you're able to have a sound that exists physically correct out in front of the speakers. So the speakers were on the back wall here. You could have the sound right here, could move around and come back and go behind. Now, it's not 360 degrees. It's not perfect hologram. Um, so there's some limitations. So you, you can't stand in between a sound source and the speaker because the sound's going to arrive at your ear earlier than uh, the correct timing. So you have to take into con uh, consideration speed of sound, many other factors to have all of the pieces of the sound wave arrive at, in physical space at the correct time. So the short video here, at the top of this box is a speaker array, and you'll see the sound wave coming down. And in the center, it's going to invert, and you'll see the correct wave. I believe I have this video from Earcom, but I don't have it credited, sorry. And from that, right there, everything in front of that is going to hear that as if the sound was coming from that physical place. What's really cool is you can put your head right in that spot, and then there's this intimacy that happens. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so this is what an array looks like. This is one that I built. Um, 
there's another photo. This is uh, probably 25 feet long. The one that's in the gallery right now is a new one. It's only 12, but it's just a part of a modular set that I'm constructing currently. Um, so I consider myself sort of an artist engineer. So I'm, I'm working at the intersection of art and technology. Um, and I like to build tools to help tell a story. So I want to go on a little tangent before I get into this particular art piece and the collaboration. Um, and what I find is when there's a story that wants to be told, that can't be told with the tools that we have, then we need to build new tools. So I want to get into a little bit of how I got into using this technology, because I think it's interesting um, to get into the why. We talk a lot about tools. We don't always talk about why we're using them. So I want to talk briefly about a show that got me into using this tech. So I'm a theater sound designer, mostly. And I was sound designing this sh theater show called After. Um, and it, it's a show about hallucinations. It's also sort of about death. Um, but we, one goal, an artistic goal of the piece was we wanted the audience to hallucinate. So we're not trying to make a show about hallucinations. We really wanted the audience to feel what this character was going through. We wanted them to hallucinate. So we turned off all the lights, taped over LE, every LED in the space, had a complete visual sensory deprivation for 20 minutes, which at that point, your brain, not having any input, will start to create neural noise, and you'll start to hallucinate. But we needed a sound score to go with it, because it's a long time to sit in a dark for a theater show. People start leaving. They think something's wrong. So I wanted to make something that would cause people to think that they couldn't trust their senses, that they were hearing something that wasn't there. Um, so I started off working with directional speakers. So I tell this story because sometimes there's tools out there that kind of do what you need, but not fully. So this is a parametric or a parabolic speaker. And what it's doing is sending high frequency ultrasonic waves that, you know, they can steer sound in certain ways. And, you know, here I am listening very closely. Um, you know, we tried them. They don't sound great. They're sort of band limited. Um, and if the high frequencies catch you at the wrong angle, they can be very obnoxious. But I would put people in all black morph suits, put actors in this, and have them stand and hold the speakers and aim them at the audience in the dark. And that was how I started trying to just get poor man's spatial audio happening all the way through theirs. Um, and it's fun. But it didn't really do what I needed. So I needed sound to be floating in space and, um, and moving in impossible ways. People needed to not know, not be able to trust what they were hearing. Um, and needed a tool that could do that. And so I happened to be developing this theater show at a place called MPAC, which is in Troy, New York. Um, and I was there when they were building a wave field synthesis array that was a higher density array than any array that had been built ever, I believe. Um, and I was sort of you know, in the right place at the right time, because I was also trying to solve this artistic problem and needed a tool that could do that. Um, they wrote a paper on it when it came out. Um, and you know, there's been lots of wave field synthesis arrays in the past. Most of them, this is in Berlin. They're permanently installed. They've, you know, they've been around for a little while. You can make pieces in there, but it takes a very long time, not very accessible. Um, also, getting sounds in front of the array wasn't exactly possible for some technical specifications. So the speakers, a lot of the common ones that were built before the impact one that I know of, uh, you know, were around 10 centimeters distance between speakers. And now the closer you can get the speakers together, the higher the frequency you can spatially render sounds accurately and also in front of the array. So the MPAC array cut this in half, five centimeters between speakers. Now all of a sudden we can get really accurate sound up to three or four K, which starts to get into the human voice. So now there's a new thing that has not really existed before, but somebody can whisper in your ear and fly around space. Um, so they gave me several sound design residencies to kind of work with this tool and work under the, you know, the construct of trying to solve my artistic problem with their tool. And it worked. Um, I ended up hanging it overhead. I find that overhead is total magic. And it's, you can scrub the rows of audience members uh, and different people 
can hear different things at different times, which is very interesting for sound because usually, like you just heard when you watch that film, you all heard the sound at the same time, right? Maybe within a few milliseconds for those of you in the back row. But essentially, you're all having the same sonic experience. But with wave field synthesis, especially when it's overhead like this, I'm able to place a sound in the back row that the front row doesn't hear at all. The front row can be hearing a piece of music that's slowly scrubbing back. Someone else in the back can be hearing a monologue. And these things can move at different speeds, depending on how they're programmed. So the, challenging, the challenges and the opportunities for composing for this are very exciting. Um, now, essentially, this worked. People hallucinated. After every one of these shows, people would tell me that they were literally not understanding what was happening. They were hearing things. They were seeing things. So the art, you know, they were actively hallucinating, which was exactly what we set out to do. But then I couldn't stop thinking about this tool. What else could it do? So many new ways to tell stories. So I built my own. So I, I spent a whole summer building a bunch of these um, in upstate New York. And now I'm doing it here at UCSD. So I'm building even more. So um, I won't show you this whole time lapse. But, but I'll show you. These are just some of the guts. So essentially, in order, you, you can't buy these or rent these, right? You have to build this stuff yourself. Lots of wiring, individual channels. That's where I used to live. It was very green. Anyways, um, and if you want to get into building this stuff, any students out there, let me know, because your, your house can look like this, too, if you would <laughs> like. And usually, this kind of system doesn't tour. But um, the, one of the ideas that I have was to get these speakers out of the university sometimes and take them out on the road, get more people access to this kind of stuff, get them off the walls, get them in a road case, tour them around. And we did that. You can also fit 12 in a Subaru if you're really good. <laughs> um, they travel. Uh, we've toured to many, many cities around the globe. Um, I have to convince people to let me drill into the ceiling sometimes, which is a, is a hard ask. But once people hear what it does, then they they're become a believer. They let me do it. That's the public theater in New York. Which then brings me to here. So now we've built a couple. These are two boxes, similar design. I'm working on some new designs coming up. Um, and I've. We're having conversations with Michael about this piece and thinking about, you know, we're in COVID. Closeness is something that is difficult during this time. Intimacy is difficult. Uh, you know, when's the last time you, you know, heard somebody sort of whisper in your ear or heard somebody whispering close to you, right? That kind of intimacy and closeness has not been common. Um, so this is what's actively um, playing all the sound in the other room, in the gallery. Uh, and you know, Michael and I collaborated on this spatial mix. And you know, one idea that was very particular to the piece was about this idea of receiving a message or witnessing a message that was not for you. And this is a good task for this system. So here's, a, here's a, you know, when that idea came up, it was like, OK, we could technically have one place where you could hear this message if you sat in the right place. And so what you've heard tonight in here, you've heard, you hear that voice. You hear that message loud and clear. There's subtitles. But when you go into the gallery, we're in a different kind of space. And if you just walk in, you're going to kind of hear the voice. You're gonna, you know that there's somebody talking, but you're not necessarily going to hear it. But if you sit in the center of the bench, it will become crystal clear, and you'll be able to hear that message just like the unintended witnesser of the message in the film. Um, also, the instruments move around. And there's kind of, we can talk about this um, in the, the Q&A if anyone has questions. But the instruments also move. And some of those gestures are tied to the editing style of the film. So there's some new ideas that we're getting into about how do you spatialize sound? Why do you move sound? How fast do you go? How do you make these decisions artistically? And so far, I have not worked with a film. So this is the first time I've worked with a film. And what I found interesting is the way that Michael has edited the film and the way the pan 
is moving. So the camera, the digital camera is moving at certain speeds. That speed starts to inform these you know, nonsensical trajectories of like how would these string players be moving through the space, but it doesn't necessarily matter. There's, um, anyways, I won't say too much more because I don't want to spoil it, but um, this is just one way that you can use this tool and we're sort of just cracking the surface on this. So hopefully the next, maybe the next chapter, we'll have a bunch of speakers up in the air and all of you here in the theater will be hearing stuff moving around as well as some kind of on stage stuff. So right now you're getting sort of a mini experience where you will get a three-dimensional space in front of the film screen in the gallery, and all of that is playing space for that sound. So listen carefully. You'll start to notice, besides just the voice, that other things are moving as well. And uh, anyways, thank you so much. I'm very excited for you all to experience the work, and thanks for having me here. So hi everyone, it's great to see you all in person. Um, it's been a pleasure to work on this show almost entirely remotely and yet still get to know um, the new members to the gallery committee and also get a chance to experience work I never would have experienced otherwise. So um, what I wanted to share with you today is on my laptop instead of Bobby's. One second, let me just do that little switch. That's better, I think. There it is. Okay. Uh, so back in 2019, um, I got to have the opportunity to lead a research project uh, with a QI initiative, the AIP program. And I sat down with three uh, students who wanted to do a project here. And um, we, been, we were talking about what they wanted to do. They probably wanted to make a game. And um, we were like, well, what should it be about? Well, it just so happened that um, all three students, CG Liu, Yixing Wang, and Hainan Xiang, happened to all be from Wuhan. And they were following the story very closely of what was happening with their families and the lockdown of their city. And um, we started wondering, well, this sure seems like something we could make an artwork about. And so we did. And at the time, um, there's a very popular game called Plague, uh, which a lot of students had played before. Um, the idea there was that uh, you are a virus and you're trying to spread across the world and infect and kill as many people as possible. <laughs> um, so we decided to make Anti-Plague, and that's the name of the game. Um, it also has a soundtrack, um, and this was uh, made by a musician who worked at Pong. Uh, Pong uh, is a research group uh, here at Qualcomm Institute. And um, I just wanted to give them credit and also let you know you're going to hear some music. So this is what the simulation looks like. It starts off with uh, lots of little green dots running around the screen from their houses going to work. And then one by one, they end up in the hospital here. And you can see the little 
little sick dots piling up in the corner here. Uh, so the students who built this wanted to give the player a couple different options. Uh, one was to place a stay at home order. So you can rerun this simulation uh, having enacted stay at home orders. And you'll see that the little dots uh, still get sick. <laughs> And you can also encourage people to wear face masks. And as you play, you see the number of deaths, the number of people who have recovered. This was all based on uh, data that we had access to in uh, January 2020. So obviously, it's a little bit outdated. Um, we did not have vaccines uh, when we made this game. Um, and I'm just going to end that there. Uh, but the point is that um, it's kind of amazing what students do, and especially once they uh, get very invested in a project. So this uh, game is going to be playing outside of the gallery in the hallway. There's a little mouse, so anyone who wants to can play with it and see it. Um, and I'm very excited to support the project um, and uh, just a shout out to the team. They've now, um, well, one is still uh, finishing up her coursework, uh, but the others have gone on to graduate school at Stanford and Harvard. Uh, kind of amazing. So congratulations to them. I know they're watching. And um, I want to pass to Shrok. such pleasure to be here. I'm still a little disoriented. I, I remember the first time that I started driving after this two years, it was strange to be behind the car. And now when I come and I see people, the energy of people, it's really quite refreshing for me. It's really new. So when Michael and Trish talked to me about this event back in the fall, I thought of it as a celebratory event. I thought it's really great moment for us to come together. Uh, the Omicron uh, kind of delayed the party, but we prevailed and we're back. So really, really be, I'm happy that we're here. I don't have a new piece for this piece. I thought about installing the piece I had made 15 years ago for opening of Cal IT2. And the piece has gone through some changes. It's a mixture of uh, electronic, and throughout the years, some acoustic material, vocals, and other acoustic materials have been added to it. It's sort of an ambient piece. It's, uh, it's the name Music for Courtyard is also a nod to Brian Eno, who coined the name ambient piece. And he coined it because one time he was sick, was fallen in, in, in the uh, hospital. He couldn't get up and turn the music louder. And the, the music was played at a really soft music. This is discrete music. And uh, he ended up listening to it that way. And he thought about a music that could be listened to or could also be ignored. And in that sense, it defines the music of an environment. And an environment has always been an important element for me. Uh, I think for every musician, Throughout their work, they think of what is music. A lot of time, we want to separate it from narrative. We want to separate it. And it always goes to this ephemeral space of not really knowing what it is. For me, I ended up thinking of it as an action. That music, uh, based on uh, somewhat of a writing of Christopher Small, the book Musicking, that music is really a verb, not a noun. We think of music as a noun, but 
in the same way I separate content and context. So the piece you'll hear outside, it's really built for the context of the space for you to experience it. And uh, when I say it's an, it's an act, it's not every act. In Musicking, Christopher Small says that anybody who's involved in the act of making the music is a musician. I think of that act in a way of resisting violence. How do you resist violence? Usually if you do want to fight it, the word fighting is violent itself. You have to collude with it. And music, for me, is an act that resists violence non-violently. It's that harmonious thing that happens in the moment that we figure out our individuality in reference to the global stage that we are. It's that sense between being altruistic and being selfish. I'm reminded of Kierkegaard's words that says when you're being an artist, you're, it's the most noble and narcissistic thing to do at the same time. And in that sense, finding that harmonious element and experience it, expressing it, for me, becomes the music. The theme of antibody as a symbol of resistance uh, reminded me of many times of many certain outcomes of our lives that I've always thought, how can we gonna get out of this? Uh, November of 2016 was one of those as well. But later we see after we were amazed how we get out of it, what we learn something from it, and it's always been enlightening. And I think the virus has shown us the past two years how connected we are together. And this connection is not only physical, it's also mental. Again, that realization that we find today, once we come back, the energy that we find from each other is exactly that. Uh, the image that you see here uh, is a photo of a Persian carpet that's uh, hanging in one of the meeting rooms of the United Nation. And the reason that it's there is because of the, a poem of a Persian poet, Saadi, the writing that is woven in it that you can't see. I'm going to read the poem, first in Persian, then I read the translation to you. I read it in Persian so you'll hear the music of it. It says, Bani Adam a'zaye yek digarand ke dar afarinesh ze yek goharand. Che ozvi be dar davarad ruzegar, degar ozv hara namanad qarar. تو که از مهنت دیگران بی غمی نشاید که نامند نهند آدمی The sons of Adam are limbs of a frame for in creation from one soul they came If hard times cause one member to feel pain at ease and rest the others can't remain If a limb's in pain and you do not care the title human being you can't share. Reminds me of the jacket that read, I really don't care, do you? But I'm also reminded of the medical community who so selflessly and tirelessly for the past two years, without a moment of hesitation, did the work and took care of us. So I. I've, I've heard from doctors, I remember one doctor, pulmonologist, who talked about those first days of COVID. And she is extremely articulate and extremely strong, but as she was talking about, about this, she said, I'm doing the work of God because I had to decide who dies and who stays alive. And now they know how to treat us, they, we, we have gone through it, but it was a truly special time. And it is true, the gift of many people, which my hat's off to them, that we're able again to be together. So again, truly, I'm happy to be with you here, and I'm happy that we can breathe the same air together. I'm hoping you'll enjoy the courtyard music. Thank you. I'll ask all of us to come to the dais, I guess, and uh, we will 
talk a little bit together. And I want to make sure we ha have time for questions from all of you uh, who are here today. So um, again, this is weird. <laughs> so thank you, um, Bobby and Trish and Sharok for your um, presentations. It was really profound to see the work and see how it comes together and how we're thinking about it. Um, we haven't all talked about it. You know, Trish and I have not talked a lot about the two pieces in conversation with each other. And Sharok and I haven't had a chance to connect uh, beyond our original conversation. And, and I'm just so grateful to um, all three of you. Um, I want to, I think, because I'd really like us all to go out and hear Sharok's piece and go and experience Bobby's sound design. So I, I, rather than, unless you all disagree, I would like to have questions from the audience. And if there are questions that you have for any of us about the film, the sound, the game, um, or, or Sharok's piece, and you might have to find Sharok in the courtyard if you have questions, because we're going to experience that, but I don't want to delay too much. So if you have questions, there are microphones on either side here. This is a weird thing to do. I'm, on, I'm so used to being on Zoom. I'm gonna start doing this, you know, and that, you know. Uh, but if you have questions for Ennis, we'd, we'd all be happy to um, hear them and respond to them. They're clean microphones too. We took special care to wipe them down. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you all. I, uh, I was really, um, trying to connect um, the prefixation ante and body um, across sort of the, the arc of the uh, gestures that were presented. And um, I suppose the, the sense that I have is the quality of the algorithm as a tissue across all the work in terms of an other rhythm or algo rhythm. And I wonder to what degree, uh, especially with uh, your work, Michael, the other element is sort of uh, unsonification or the un prefixation. Yeah. And I'm teaching a class on unfinished, unmade, undone. Yeah. And, and focusing on the sort of aesthetic trajectories of prefixations. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose it's a long-winded way to say there is something about algorithms across the work and also around prefixations in, in one way or another. Uh, unsounds or unsoundings, uh, anti-plague or unplagues, um, anti-sound or unsound of the ambient uh, being somewhere in that territory. So I don't know if it's really a question, but uh, more the prefixations in the work. Yeah, I mean the idea of unmusicking or anti-musicking as a you know the verb uh, it comes to mind as well. You know what is it to be to 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 commit an act of anti-musicking mm -hmm. as opposed to musicking, which is to that violence piece I think that you were t speaking of. For for me, unmake the uncosmos was you know very much about what what you're describing this this. Uh, this thinking about um, uh, not just social distancing as the sort of like ominous phrase that we just started using as if it was a normal thing to say out loud um, and write in posts online, you know, practicing social distancing. And, um, and I think also in a lot of my work and in my teaching and in my just the last, you know, 30 years uh, of, of being an adult, uh, is sort of ideas of unlearning and unlearning what has been taught, unlearning and, and kind of, and what I, what I mean when I say unlearning, it's sort, of, um, it's sort of a critical examination, especially for me around racial identity and gender identity and unlearning and, and sort of extrapolating and exposing where my own, uh, my own privilege and my own complicity as a white cishet man shows up in my life and in the world and in my consciousness. And unlearning that is a kind of a lifelong educational pursuit for me. And the idea of unlearning feels, one of the ways that I approach that work is, is sort of a kind of a radical interrogation of my own mind, my own experiences, my own actions, and, uh, and, and with, with failures and successes on balance here and there. 
Um, and so the idea of unmaking became something that was interesting to me during pandemic because unmaking, I felt like I couldn't make anything. I couldn't, I couldn't shoot anything. I couldn't perform anywhere. I couldn't do anything. I'm unmaking everything. And, um, and I was learning this new tool that I didn't know how to use and using a new tool for the first time. And I'm curious, I'm sure Bobby and Trish and Shrok experienced this as well, but it, I felt like I was learning to speak like a two-year-old or something, you know, where I was learning a new language. And so I'm very comfortable in music. I feel like I, I have a long history with music, so I can speak very quote unquote fluently in music. But working with 3D animation and CGI, I had never done it before. And I started March 11th. I bought the program on March 11th of 2020 and just started teaching myself. And I realized that it was just a lot of unlearning and unmaking and just doing things that were terrible. I made thousands of things that are, f that are terrible, you know? And so I was unmaking. And one of the things I started thinking about was like the, the, the prefixification, or I forgot how you put it, but is that the, to unmake is also kind of beautiful, right? To unmake the bank, to unmake the police, to unmake the university can also be a radical act and a kind of beautiful act, an act of love even. And what would we want to unmake? Well, anything that isn't the cosmos, anything that isn't cosmic. And so unmaking the uncosmos became a way of kind of conceptualizing it around the idea of kind of uh, in the same relationship to the anti, the antibody, the antibodies, the anti-plague, and so on. I'm curious if... Right. You should unfixate. No, no. I said you could unfixate on it too. Um, yeah, that's a really great. It's an interesting observation. I hadn't thought about that at all. <laughs> I mean, it's. I really hadn't. That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's why you're the boss. Um, <laughs> any thoughts on this piece? Well, one thing that I found interesting with, I think this is the first time I've had uh, string instruments, right, which are normally played by real people in real space, um, physicalized in physical space. Physicalized? Is that right? Wave field synthesized, maybe, mm. um, in physical space. And you know, we were making decisions about, well, let's have the cellist over here and the violin, and then let's put this person here. Or like, oh, should we have this traditional arrangement? Should we split them up? And what's interesting is there's no players. So even though when you sit there, if you closed your eyes, there's moments that it can sound very real. Um, it's not real, right? And th and there's an unplayer there. Yeah. There's there's non-players. And what does that mean to have to listen to a concert that is three-dimensional, as if there are players, but to not see anybody? And I think some of that was interesting to me yeah. in this kind of COVID landscape. And I didn't record players for yeah. it. I also you know too. I the music was composed and it just like I said, I got obsessed in August. So it was composed in a very kind of traditional, old-fashioned, not hip or not music school hip. <laughs> <laughs> of just like literally like notating this, this, this string quartet. But then I was like, I wanted to hear it. And so I just spent good money on the Spitfire Audio string quartet library, the Sakoni S strings, I think, which is just a contact instrument that will play back those sounds uh, in, a, in a notation software. So I used notation software. But, but the simulacra of it all was mm -hmm. kind of interesting that the, that the visuals are simulated, that the music is composed but not performed and so simulated and there there were a lot of gestures and a lot of moments in the music that I would have there were so many things I wanted to do that the, that the sample library won't do and that the notation software doesn't articulate well that if I just had a player in front of me and say just portamento this one you know just something very simple the, the software can't figure it out the algorithm uh, forces itself on you and so writing kind of around that became a challenge. And so then sound designing it, it's interesting to me to think about it the way you put it, that placing players around who've already been limited by an algorithm, it's, it's, it, it's this, it's this um, tightness yeah. that we're pushing against in some way. Yeah. yeah. Territory of the sound is dislocated, mm. uh, 
uh, from its imagined origin, I thought was also uh, really powerful in relationship to uh, the process. And I, I was remembering when I was uh, a, uh, a young and an usher at movie theaters, when they had ushers in movie theaters, and they were playing uh, Earthquake with Charlton Heston <laughs> that had fence around, right? Yeah. Which were these massive speakers in the Cinerama or the Cinedome. And I remember as ushers, every time the earthquake was going to hit Ava Gardner's house, we would run and attach <laughs> ourselves to the speaker <laughs> so that we would be you you know, would destroyed vibrate. by the sound. Uh, but, uh, you know, it wasn't of, of that kind of uh, uh, elimination mm. of the body, but it really was intense in the density. Mm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Other other questions? Oh, please. Yeah. I'm sorry. Hi. Yeah, you've started to to get into this, um, but I'm trying to wrap my head around the technology here and, and this this whole pipeline. Can you speak to this challenge of trying to um, edit audio spatially and 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 trying to to place all these different sounds, you, you know, in in the spatial context? Yeah. Um, so, essentially. It, for the end user, right? Maybe I'll, I'll start there because I consider myself, I always try to think like someone using the tool, not this, even though sometimes I have to put on the design the tool, at the end of the day, it, what I'm interested in is somebody being able to use this easily. Um, so at the end of the day, say this is the room, there could be an XY pad that's, you know, you can have, uh, you know, virtually represented on the screen and you can have, this is your speaker, this is the room, you can grab a dot and move it around and you can locate the sound where you want it. So, you know, there's a long answer for how do you get there, but the short answer is at the end of the day, you're moving stuff around on a 2D overview map. And then you record that movement into a digital audio workstation in automation, the same way you might automate volume, you can automate movement. So it, this becomes an XY pad, you can automate the X and the Y. So right now it's not three dimensional, so there's no Z access yet, soon, maybe. <laughs> um, but essentially at the end of the day, I'm, I'm actually, it's as easy as, I, I could set it up with an iPad where you just are moving it around and stuff is moving around a physical location. And that's the, that's the hope is that someone doesn't need a whole lot of programming experience, that they can come in and say, I have an idea and I want the, you know, Michael has this idea, I want the sound to only be in this one spot. Well, grab it, move it, save it. There you go, idea is done. It's the same way, like, not everyone knows how to build a subwoofer, but they know how to use one, you know? You get in your car and you put on some, some music with some low end, turn up the bass, like, you know how to use it. I want it to be as easy as that for, for folks. Michael, that's my favorite film of yours. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about it. And Trish, the film that your st students, that you made with your students, I would just love to show that to my art and technology students next quarter. Awesome. I had no idea that your students had done that. Um, and Tarok, always great to hear your music. And I love seeing the Viz department and the music department together here. So I have a question for Bobby, who I've never met. And a um, couple of things. It, the battery of sound stunningly reminded me of, of uh, Marbridge's cameras. Do you know this example? And the idea of moving through um, the cameras was very much about uh, the body triggering the sound by its movement. So I'm working on a project at the Birch Aquarium that involves some installations in 2024. And so I have a practical goal with my question. We're trying to figure out how to have um, an outdoor space that would essentially do what your controlled indoor environment would do. And I'm wondering if your system is adaptable to a coastal outdoor space. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, technically, you can do the same moves, right? You can move sound around, and it's physically accurate. Uh, perceptually, though, um, it depends on what else is going on in mm. your ears. So there's a big issue of perception with this kind of invisible three-dimensional sound. That's mostly, I think, because we're sort of a visually oriented species your eyes believe what they believe. So if, um, 
if you're in a quiet room, and like in this case, when you're watching a screen, you're kind of paying attention to that, you can start to do two things at once. Um, when you're outside, there's a, it depends on the ambience outside. So if it was very, very quiet, I think that's the answer. It would work. If, it's, if there's a noise floor, um, it becomes more challenging. Crashing waves. Yeah, it can yeah. be hard, but um, I'm always up for trying. So the, uh, we can talk later. But yes, but I think there is a big um, issue with perception. And actually, even in the, in the room we were in, in the gallery, there's the HVAC system that's quite prominent. Um, and what I did uh, is, because you can't turn it off, um, and we definitely need airflow in this time, right? So I can't even be a grumpy sound designer and say, turn it <laughs> off. Um, I'm not going to do that. Um, I recorded it, and we put it in the piece very quietly. But it's in there, and it sometimes will come past you. And this is—it's very, very subtle. It's very funny because that connects with Shirok's idea from Eno's ambient sound. That's, that's exactly. a great connection. Yeah, yeah. and and yeah. I think that there's there's uh, maybe a possibility with the ocean waves too. Or there's something in there. So if you if you accept the environment, can you use can the system respond? So yeah, I think it'll. I'll have to think about that more. I probably have to go there and listen to it. But, oh, fantastic! Yeah. yeah, I look forward to chatting. Yeah, great presentation, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Are there other questions? I mean, I have, I have a question just thinking about this around um, virtuality, right? And so like I made most of my project virtually. You made it with me, but it's, you're kind of dealing with virtual three-dimensional space. And, and Trish made this both, both made the, the game with your students kind of virtually but it's also about a virtuality. And I'm curious if you can, if you would like to say anything about not just that game, but the way in which kind of game making and virtual making can, it kind of connects to sort of the, the, between the virtual and, and the quarantine. Sort of if you're, if you, how you think about virtuality vis-a-vis -vis the antibody, the resistance, et cetera. You may have thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um, just to say, uh, one little thing about Bobby's comment about the HVAC that having worked here as long as I have there has never been a musician who has happily dealt with the HVAC system <laughs> you're the first and um, kudos to <laughs> the theater background for bringing in that kind of flexibility um, Yes, I think the the virtual is an interesting concept in, in all of these works, you know, and especially when you think about um, imagined bodies and imagined spaces, imagined sounds that may or may not exist, and um, our reality in terms of uh, living on one side of a laptop screen from the rest of our students and the rest of the world, right? So we are an, we are inhabiting a very um, particularly strange place right now and um, the the virtual world is very compelling as a result you know it's a place for entertainment it's a place for education and it's a place where people can um, come together socially networked in a networked way um, so I, I think it's very rich territory and um, I would actually be interested in in seeing a show about that if we get the chance you know and see some more works and how people respond to that idea yeah, thank you. Well, we have a question from online. oh, online. Oh, that's good. Hopefully, it's not vulgar. <laughs> no. <laughs> ah, the so the, the question online is: um, I want to know if Michael's robo performers had any advantages in the robo environment. Would real players have been too human for such a place? Ah. Can you read the word? Was it robo performer? Yes. Huh. <laughs> Uh, if um, if Michael's robo performers had any advantages in the robo environment, would real players have been too human for such a place? Oh, um, well, there's the so I'll, not I'm not sure exactly which piece of it. Whether it's like if we're talking about actors, like actors could have pulled off everything in the film. I just couldn't get actors because everyone was locked down. But I think in terms of the theme of the show, like why is everyone's head covered, and are these human beings that we're looking at? Are they wearing helmets? Are they wearing masks? Are they covered? Um, every human in the film is, has their face or head covered in some way. Um, and some of them have painted their skin blue and some of them, it looks like they could be robots. They could be robo performers, right? Um, I think any of those, any of those sequences from a, from a, if I were to film them 
in a normal context, I would have just hired ma models and actors to play those roles. One of the opportunities, and in fact, me, it's me sitting in the chair, right? Sort of sitting in that chair as the villain. And I just, I removed my own head and put a digital helmet head there instead, right? Um, but I think that I was really interested in sort of the, the elephant as a contrast to the human body, that the elephant looks like a human and the humans look like they could be like astronauts or robots or androids or kind of what, what are, they? are they drones? What are they? And I was really interested in that, the tension between how we perceive the elephant and what feelings we have for the elephant. And then also the, the woman on the screen whose voice we hear, we really hear her as a person, as a human being. And yet her image becomes distorted in many throughout. And while her voice is clear, her image is distorted. And so I was really interested in sort of playing with um, where are we as a listener? And you, we talked about this uh, in terms of how you designed the sound, right? Um, are we hearing what she's saying and thinking, oh my God, I feel so bad for that elephant. <laughs> Those are mean things. Or are we, you know, or is it a matter of we're hearing what she's saying and, and thinking that elephant is really there to li listen and witness her righteous rage and her resilience and the cultivation of their, their new moon, as she describes it. Um, kind of all these reactions are possible and the tension is in, it kind of is implied, but also kind of explicit by me because the people in it are not, um, it's not really about the, the people as much as it is about the woman on the screen and this kind of resistance to a kind of villainy of, of Baroque technocratic largesse. <laughs> I got a, that's the name of my memoir also, <laughs> Baroque technocratic largesse. Um, so I don't know robot question uh, if that answers it, but I think, does that seem to answer it? Okay. Sure. All right, robo performer. Robot, they, they're all animated, but there's nothing, they're just sitting around, right? They're just like loafs. Uh, they move their feet a little, they move their head. Once you start moving digital characters around, they look super fake. And if you just sit them there and light them well, you can kind of like pass the test a little bit. And you know, if you put a real person in and change their head, you can kind of buy it here and there. But as soon as you have them walking or moving or picking up a glass, you're like, oh man, that's a cartoon. And so um, people, I would have preferred people for those reasons. I'd like for them to do more than just sit around. I'm not sure if this was a question. <laughs> you said that, uh, I think they're talking about the string quartet. Oh, damn. Yeah. Oh, Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, the string quartet. There's nothing that the people, I did not write, this is where I said my music was kind of square, kind of, uh, I, and I know it was square, you know, but there's nothing I wrote for the string quartet to do that a performer couldn't do. Uh, Everything I wrote a performer could do easily, much more easily than Contact Player was able to do. And if I were to write one for performers, I would hope, knock on wood or whatever, I would hope I would write a more interesting music that would take advantage of the dynamic and, and kind of wildly creative potential of a human player who can do so many more things than a MIDI controller and a, sequ and a sequencer can. So, I mean, unless you're writing music that is like Square Pusher or something that's intentionally designed to kind of, you know, play with the impossible sequence, the impossible MIDI uh, composition, but that wasn't what my goal was. So I think that's what I'm, that, that, makes, that makes more sense as a question and, and an answer. Hi, this question is for both Michael and Bobby. Since I know you, you two are collaborating for the first time, I was curious, did working together change the way you see your own work? First and last. No, I'm joking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know this is this is a new tool for me still. Even though I've been, you know, this is the second time I've been building these things from scratch, and um, and I like discovering how to use that tool with someone else. Mm. Um, I'm 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 a theater person, so I'm a collaborator by heart. Um, and I'm not a solo artist generally, although I have made pieces for the Wavefield Synthesis Arrays um, that are solo pieces. But um, yeah, I think what uh, was most unique was also working with uh, image, working with a film. Um, and I had not done that yet. And I do, I think that there is a lot of potential there and I haven't quite found someone to work with 
on that of the difference of closeness to and distance on the screen to the sound so and I think there's something there that could be cracked and, and I don't work in film a lot but I'm getting more interested in it and I think that there's there's a match there so yeah this is kind of cracked open a lot of ideas yeah. for sure. the same for me I mean we started this project I think I presented you rough like sketches of like storyboard ideas in like November like before Thanksgiving so it came together really quickly and virtually right by and large um, but for me the once I saw once I kind of came about I guess a month ago and came and saw the cut of the film with what Bobby had designed um, yes all kinds of new ideas opened up like oh you can do this and you can do this and I was kind of not regretting but I was wishing I had more than just four string quartet instruments and a voice I wish I have a sound design practice and a sound practice more broadly and I was and I was like oh we could do this and and once he had this solution about the air conditioner, I'm like, oh man, we could have multiple, you know, it's kind of very inspiring. And I think it takes not just like good conversation with a, with a person who's, you know, I'll say this, they're gonna be compliments, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> but a person like who's very professional, but also like normal and nice, like that's like hard to find. You know what I mean? Like very good at what they're doing and normal. And so those conversations are great, but then when you experience the thing, it's like, you're like, oh, wow, this is possible. And, and so it's not just a collaboration on a kind of like, oh, we can communicate. But it was the collaboration on, uh, for me anyway, not having had really the experience of this, the, the sound hologram as you describe it, the, the capacity for that as something that's stable as opposed to something that is, that must fly past you. I think if you think of 3D films, I'm not gonna steal your thing, <laughs> but like if you, you know, the hammer coming at you is what I, was expecting and when instead what I got was a thing that when 3D films work it's you really get a sense of space and depth and you know kind of not so much mm -hmm. not to render it too closely but that's that was my experience and it was it was very interesting so I have lots of ideas I'm gonna bother Bobby a lot <laughs> poor Bobby thank you thank you so unless there, and you know, we'll all be out there. And so I'm thinking it would be great for all of you to have the opportunity to hear um, Sharok's piece in the courtyard mm -hmm. and to hear the sound design we're talking about so you can experience it and enjoy some refreshments in the courtyard uh, and safely and distanced and being careful for all, around all of that. I can't thank the three of you enough uh, for, for joining me on the stage for this. And thank you all for coming. It's really been a delight to see all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>